So for those of you who may not have seen me today, I'm Dan Rayburn, I'm the conference chairman. I'd like to thank everyone for making it today. I've gotten all your emails from those who want copies of presentations. I have a lot of the presentations already. I'll put them online tonight. I'll send you all links tonight for anybody who wants it. If you haven't sent me an email, if you email dan at streamingmedia.com, I'll be happy to send you links to any of the presentations you saw today. I have probably 90% of them already. If you go to contentdeliverysummit.com tomorrow, and you click on the agenda page, you'll see all the presentations listed out under the session names. So today I'm going to talk about the state of the CDM market. I'm going to talk about some video pricing. I'm going to talk about market sizing. Uh, I've got quite a bit to talk about today. So I'm going to try and get through this as quickly as I can. I want to do as many questions today as I can, not just about CDM pricing, but any other things you may have heard at the show. So to start off, here's the agenda. I'm going to talk about the segmentation of the CDM market. Over the years, we've seen CDN be thought of, as I said this morning, as just video services, but it's really encompassing a lot of different services today. I'm going to talk about some of the new entrants in the space. I'm going to talk about market size for CDN services, specific to media services, and the CDN contribution from a revenue standpoint that it makes up for some of the companies. We're going to talk about what's causing CDN traffic to grow, software downloads, gaming, a lot of non-video content. I'm going to highlight some telco and carrier deployments, of which there's really very few from a commercial standpoint, but I'm going to touch on that. I'm going to talk about some volume customers moving to in-house CDNs. Think Apple, Valve, Pandora, some of the folks you heard from today. I'm going to talk a little bit about Amazon, their potential to disrupt the market over time. I'm going to talk about quality of service data some of the information that's re recently come out from Conviva. I'm going to talk about 4K. There's way too much hype in the industry about 4K, so I'm going to talk about that. And then I'm going to give out the latest pricing trends from the survey that I just completed in March and April of this year. So to start off, uh, I know these are a lot of points here, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. The key ones to think about is that commodity CDN for video is going to be down about 20% this year. Pricing-wise, year-over-year, about 20%. Um, sorry, 20% last year. This year, it's going to be down even less, about 15%. The primary reason for that is, as I said during my transit pricing presentation, a lot of the vendors have just gotten a lot better at walking away from deals that are at a too low of a price point. They realize that they have to make high enough margins on this to satisfy management and investors. So even though they might be able to make some margins by reducing their price, they have a percentage that they want to make, and that's really what they're aiming for. So that's a good thing for the whole industry. I know some customers might think that's bad because maybe they don't get as big a pricing break as they want, but you have to realize at some point, and for those customers who have been using CDNs for 10 years, it also doesn't help if your CDN goes out of business every year. So if you go to cdnlist.com, that's a list of my blog of all the CDN vendors in the space. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, it's the history of the CDN market. It lists every CDN vendor from the beginning of the old Sandpiper days and basically what happened to them between now and uh, then and now. And you can see just how many CDNs went out of business year after year after year after year because they came to the market and said, we're going to grab market share by offering a low price. And then 18 months later, it was, oops, we made no money and we can't raise another round, so they go under. So a lot of the customers from the old days using CDNs would complain that every year they're jumping to a new CDN because the others go under. So it actually does help customers in the long run. It means that they have a partner they can work with that's much more stable. And hopefully that means they also get better quality over time with their CDN as well. Customers are starting to see and have been seeing good video growth. But there is no catalyst. Everybody always asks me, what is the catalyst to this market really exploding? Is it um, you know, HBO Now? Is it the new Sling TV service? Is it Apple coming out with a potential service? Is it new devices, new iPads? It's really nothing. It's a combination of all of those that helps the market grow. But there is no single device, single platform that is really a catalyst to where the market grows at a multitude every single year. It's nice, slow, steady growth is what we want. We don't want the old days in the dot-com era of where things grew too fast and projections were set that weren't met 
that made a lot of people unhappy and made a lot of companies go under. So realistic expectations is what's most important in this space. New OTT services, a lot of people ask, Sling TV, PlayStation View, HBO Now, these are not big drivers for the CDM market as a whole. So when I say that, some people kind of look at me like, that's impossible, HBO Now is big, it's a big company, but you have to think about it. HBO Now right now is exclusive only to uh, Apple TV, besides Apple devices. Apple sold 25 million boxes worldwide. If out of those boxes, 15 million have been sold in the US, what percentage of people who have an Apple TV are gonna sign up for HBO Now? Out of that 15 million, how many are unique? Somebody like myself who has three or four Apple boxes at home, break the numbers down. Let's say they're reaching 12 million unique subs in the US with an Apple TV box. What percentage of those sign up for HBO Now? Even if it's 10%, you're talking a million subs. One million subs isn't gonna impact CDNs. It's gonna help with the growth, but it's not that catalyst that some are projecting. Software and large object downloads are driving a lot of the growth in the M&E vertical. I'm gonna give a list shortly of what some of those downloads are. But for all the talk of video on the internet, um, for anybody who has streaming devices at home, especially the gaming consoles, the download size of these updates on the Xbox One and PS4 are huge. They're two and three gigs a piece for dashboard upgrades. Then you have some of the games themselves that are 60 gigs in size. So downloads from, from gaming is, is big. Um, so I'm going to give a list of those. Impact of mobile devices is not a major force. Again, people think I'm crazy, but you have to remember, when you're viewing a video on your iPhone, it's typically at one quarter of the bandwidth that you're consuming when you're viewing it on your computer. So it's good that a lot of people are consuming video on mobile and tablets and other devices, but they're viewing it typically at a much lower resolution with fewer bits and in a shorter period of time. So the latest number is just by Facebook. They're delivering three billion video views a day across their entire platform. That's a huge number, but the average video view is 20 seconds or under. So you have to have such a large number of playbacks to be able to make up for the smaller bit rate. So mobile devices, again, it's helping the industry grow, but it's not gonna make the industry pop. 4K streaming, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna have a whole slide on that. Uh, Apple, if they come out with this subscription service, I'm hearing all kinds of crazy things. Um, it's still not gonna be a huge uh, growth driver for the CDNs. We've also heard about Apple potentially doing things for many years, so as far as I'm concerned, until a company comes out with it, proves it works in the market, and actually signs up a large enough number of subscribers, nobody should be giving them credit for it. You have a lot of new entrants coming into the market. You've seen a lot today. Fastly, Yoda, Instart Logic, Twin Prime, RevSW, Quicker, and there's more on the way. The good news is that the CDM market is really starting to fragment where there are some CDNs that will provide an end-to-end -end ecosystem for a lot of different services. But there are some customers who want to use a CDN who specializes in something like just mobile content acceleration. And that's a very different service than delivering live streaming of video and events. So you have a lot of new vendors coming into the market who are trying to solve specific problems instead of trying to do everything. Very focused, they're going after typically one vertical. They're not selling into media, enterprise, education, government, and that's good because it means as a customer, as a content owner, you have a lot more choices in the market. You have specialists in the market. So that's a good thing. Video takes up the largest percent of traffic on a CDN's network, but it also contributes the least amount of profitable revenue if you look at all of their product lines. So that's the other thing the CDNs are always looking at is how can they optimize their costs, be it transit, be it co-location, how can they reduce their cost on those services they have to buy so that they can make more money off of video. Everything with CDN is economics of scale. It's a volume-based business. Um, we're going to see some acquisitions over the next few years, but we're not going to see it for video CDN services. There's only a few major video CDN providers left. You know, if you think of the Amazon, you think of the Akamai's, you think of the Level 3, you think of the Verizons, there's probably not a big chance of those guys getting bought. It's not to say they can't be. But it's not as if, if you go to cdnlist.com, you can see it's not as if we have four or five or six different CDN vendors who are doing 30, 40, 50 million dollars a year that can be acquired. Those guys are gone. They don't exist. There's very few of them. 
So there's not a lot of acquisitions out there unless you start going into the specialty services of dynamic content acceleration, mobile content acceleration, security services, front end optimization, other things outside of video. As I mentioned, vendors have gotten extremely focused. Many realize that when it comes to downloads and media and delivering video, it's more of a checkbox for them. It's something that they know they have to have in addition to other services. You have an interesting trend where over the years, Amazon has decided with AWS to build everything themselves with CloudFront. So everything Amazon has, they built themselves. Then you have Microsoft who's taking the approach of let's partner. So Microsoft pushes all their video through Verizon's CDN. But then they also partner with other companies to do transcoding and signal acquisition. So interesting to see two of the largest cloud providers take two completely different approaches to the market. One wants to work with best of breed companies and one wants to build it themselves. Is one better than the other? Not necessarily, it depends what you need. There's a lot of variables, but it's a very interesting approach. So even with all that said, CDNs should be able to grow their business very nicely this year. The average CDN should be able to grow their business somewhere between 12 to 18%. If they're large, think an Akamai size custom, uh, vendor. If they're smaller, they should be able to grow at double that, at least. Pricing is down, traffic is up, transit pricing is down, co-location pricing is pretty stable. There's some places where it's still pretty expensive. But basically what I'm saying is it should be a good year for the CDNs. So this is from Q4 of last year. I know it's a little outdated, but it was a good example of just everything that happened within a two-week period. So when we're talking about growth coming from more than just video, um, in a span of two weeks, you had a live stream of Monday Night Football. You had Apple's product announcement, which was live. You had the Microsoft security patches on the Tuesday. You had NFL Now, and Tuesday's the busiest day for that. You had a Yahoo Aerosmith concert. You had the Bungie's release of the Destiny game. You had two EA Sports games. Uh, League of Legends streaming, again gaming. Xbox free game releases, which they do twice a month. Uh, you had the Destiny Bundle by PS4. You had Fashion Week in New York City. You had Apple's iOS 8 download, which of course was huge. And you had the President's Speech. You had all of this in a span of two weeks. So that's where a lot of this traffic is coming from. If you look at these, half of these are not streaming and they're not video. They're large object delivery. They're software downloads. And if you listen to the earnings calls of some of the major CDNs out there, they specifically call out and say that the growth of our media business is really being driven by software downloads and large object delivery. So that's certainly good to see, it diversifies. You're not gonna be able to read these. Sorry, I couldn't make it any larger and still get all the information. So basically, I wanted to give everybody out uh, an idea of revenue from CDNs in the space for the last three years, 13, 14, and 15. So this is revenue from Educast, Akamai, Level 3, Amazon, Limelight, Highwinds, Fastly, and China Cash. Then I wrapped it all up in this slide to make it easier. So what I did was I took their revenue and then I broke out what percentage of it was specific to uh, media and software delivery. The takeaway number here is that these CDN service providers combined will generate $4 billion this year for media and software delivery. It's a large market. Now, you'll see reports out there that say the CDN market is $50 billion or $20 billion. Be very careful what numbers you look at because most of those include everything under CDN. Hardware, software, co-location, professional services, security. You have to look at the methodology of the numbers that are put out there. So this is specifically from media and software delivery. So what I did was I looked at, for instance, EdgeCast revenue projected in 2015 is $180 million. But only 70% of that comes from media delivery services. The other percentage comes from, as I say here, acceleration, security, license CDN. So on the bottom here I say these numbers do not include revenue from hosting providers, carrier revenue, managed or licensed CDN, but it does include resellers. So somebody like AT&T that resells Akamai, those numbers are baked into Akamai's media delivery services revenue here. These numbers do not include revenue from security, um, dynamic content delivery, app acceleration, professional services. These numbers do include storage. Uh, all these numbers here, almost all of them are public, Edgecast, Limelight, Akamai, China Cash, 
Uh, level three is an estimate, but it's a public estimate from the company that I'm allowed to use. Amazon, for the first time, broke out their AWS revenue just a few weeks ago. This number that I give out here is my estimate on what the total number of them is for the year, what percentage of that is just based on CloudFront, including storage, software downloads, and streaming. Uh, Fastly, that's my number that I'm projecting there. So if you want to see all the numbers, the slide before it, you can see the growth of all the CDNs. Let's go into 4K for a minute. This is really important. Having been in the industry 20 years and having seen the dot-com bubble burst uh, and all the companies that went under and the amount of money that VCs and investors put into companies based on projections, my entire goal since then has been to set expectations properly for the industry and the market. So it bothers me when there's so many vendors and companies out there hyping 4K streaming when it's not a debate because the numbers don't lie. The numbers tell you what can be delivered and what can't be delivered and what it costs and what it doesn't cost. So let's be realistic. If you look at the number, if you look at Netflix's ISP speed index rating, this is just from the one for last month, the top 10 ISPs are delivering Netflix at an average of 3.5 megs per second. Amazon, Netflix, and Comcast all have 4K streaming at between 15 and 20. So think about the difference of going from three or three and a half to 15. It's a huge, huge difference. A content owner who wants to have 25% of their traffic be at 4K is going to see a bandwidth bill of 40 to 50% additional cost per month. And that's with the economics of scale kicking in and the lower pricing. Now, forget all the other problems we have if people don't have 4K TVs on average. People don't have 4K computers. And then you look at the information from Conviva, which says what portion of all the video streams delivered in HD are having a problem. It's a huge amount. Conviva puts out some really good information. So when Conviva is saying a large percentage of people are having problem getting a reliable 3 meg stream, what's going to happen when you have to push out a 15 or 16 meg stream? Some people will argue, well, with HEVC, you're going to have better compression, going from H.264 to H.265. But even if you look at some of the things folks like Netflix is, have said here on the stage last year or the year before, they're hoping to see a 20 percent uh, 20% uh, compression from H.265 compared to H.264, and that's over a two-year period. So H.265 with 4K, you're not going to get bit rates down to 3 or 4 or 5 megs. They're still going to be large. Even if you get it down to 12 megs a couple years from now, that's still four times what you're delivering today. So here's the question. If you're a content owner and your entire business is based on selling pre-roll in-stream, in-page, or post-roll ads, or advertising in some way, shape, or form, how can your business become profitable if now all of a sudden you're delivering four times as many bits every month? You can't, because now the economics don't make sense from a CPM standpoint. The average CPM for videos these days is $20 per thousand. If you don't know how CPMs work, it's very simple. It's basically per thousand. So for every thousand pre-rolled videos I deliver, if you're CNN or Yahoo or whoever, you typically get paid 20 bucks. It's not a lot of money. And a lot of times you have to split that between an ad network, syndication partner, an ad exchange. So anybody who's delivering 4K and has an ad business, they can't afford to do 4K. It's a business problem. So for all the talk in the industry about technology, we have to compress it more. We have to have better decoders. We have to have it in our phones. It has to be at the chip. Even if you solve all that problem, the business problem still exists. Content owners can't afford it. Even Netflix, who charges a dollar more, by the way, every month if you want 4K, says that they're only going to have a limited amount of content in 4K for years to come. So they can afford to put out some 4K as can others because they're large enough and they can test the waters. But also keep in mind that if you want 4K, it has to be shot in 4K. So what people don't realize about 4K is everyone's talking about the bits. The moment you're doing something in 4K, you're also using a lot more storage. So now you're paying for more storage. The time to encode a video from H.264 to H.265 today, on average, takes seven times longer. 
Well, now you need more encoding hardware or better hardware for encoding, and you need more people to monitor it all. There's an entire workflow that's being impacted by 4K. So the idea that 4K is going to be here tomorrow and it's going to be here in the masses and this is going to propel the industry forward, it's not going to happen. Be realistic. Look at the numbers. They're definitely out there. If you ask content owners why they're not moving for 4K, most of them, they're very clear. They'll say it just doesn't make sense. There's not enough adoption today of devices. So 4K is still a long way off. So let's go into video pricing. So this is the survey I do every year. Um, this doesn't include the numbers from all the, the customers I talk to on a daily basis or email me contracts and proposals. This is a, an email I did out to media and broadcast customers. There were 700 qualified surveys completed. So by qualified, I mean I cut anybody, else, anybody out who said that they use YouTube as their CDN. I got a couple of those. Or they took a CDN survey and filled out all the questions, and at the end they said they don't use a CDN. Um, so I cut all those out. These 700 are qualified. It was collected in March and April of this year. All the questions are specific to, this is very important, to video delivery. So this is specific to video delivery. Uh, this pricing is from commercial CDNs, the major guys. This is not from you know, a small hosting provider in New York City or London. This is from the major players. We asked 15 questions about pricing, volume, contract, length which vendors they use, their traffic growth year over year. So I broke the data out based on the size of customer and based on contract value the same way I did last year. As it says on the bottom there in red, there are a lot of variables. Okay, this is not an exact science. This is an estimate. So every once in a while, I do get a CDN who calls me and says, customer A just called me and said they saw your presentation. They said they should pay this. Well, it depends. Is it a 12-month contract? Is it delivery in North America? Is it global? Is it downloads? Is it flash streaming using a proprietary protocol? There's a lot of variables. So this is an estimate. Customers spending more than $1 million per year. On average, they're seeing their pricing fall 31% this year. If you look at 2014, it was down 26%. 2013, it was down 19%. As far as traffic growth, they're expecting growth of 164% this year. Last year, it was 126%. Now, a couple things to think about these size customers. The largest customers out there, there's a small handful of customers that make up the largest percentage of traffic out there. So when you want to think about the average pricing, it's not customers like who are spending a million dollars a year. It's not an Apple. It's not a Major League Baseball and Netflix. The average customer is not that size. So. This pricing obviously is very specific to some of the largest customers out there. You really want to think about the average pricing for a customer. The CDNs are going after a customer who spends, you know, they love customers who are spending $20,000, $25,000 a month, $50,000 a month on media delivery. So that's about a half a million dollar a year customer. That is their sweet spot. That is really what they want all day long. So pricing 10 petabytes a month, a low of six tenths of a fraction of a penny a high of a penny in 2014, it was at 7 tenths and 2. So it's come down a little bit, but not a lot. Also, if you talk to the CDNs and even the ones who are public and do quarterly earnings calls, they've made it very clear that pricing is stable, has been stable for some time. In 2009, pricing fell 45%. 2010, it fell 40%. 2011, it fell 30%. 2012 is really when it started leveling off. 2012, it was at 25%. Um, 2013, I think it was about 20, 25. Last year, it was around 20. This year, it'll be around 15. So if you look at that sliding scale, it's been extremely level over the past pretty much three years, and I expect that to continue. Um, they also have some pricing here on those customers doing per meg sustained, which is not a lot of customers. Most are still doing a per gig delivered, but there's some pricing on that as well. So these are the customers spending half a million to a million. Pricing was down 22% this year on average. They expect traffic to grow 83%. They're doing two to four petabytes a month. They're paying anywhere between eight tenths of a fraction of a penny and a penny and a half. Uh, compared to 2014, it's very similar. 22% this year, 20% last year. 83% this year versus 60% in terms of traffic growth. 
Uh, pricing is down on the low end, two tenths of a fraction of a penny. So pretty stable. Um, some people might think is, is two tenths of a fraction of a penny decline over year over year stable. That is stable. Uh, we had times in this industry, even three to four years ago, when pricing would go from, you know, for certain contracts, five cents. Next year it would be two cents. So we used to see a big drop in pricing for quite some time. This is really the sweet spot for the CDNs, this size customer, 250 to 500K. Pricing was down only 12% this year compared to last year. In 2014, it was down 14%. When you think about that, customers who are smaller, who are pushing less traffic, are going to see less pricing declines. Again, it goes back to the economics of scale. So the more you push, the lower price you're going to get. But even if you push a lot, even if you grow a lot, you're only going to get a certain amount of reduction. For smaller customers, they don't expect, nor do they get a larger decline. They expect traffic to grow 68% this year versus last year 78%. Pricing was low of one cent, high of three. Last year pricing was two, high of five. Uh, per meg pricing, I don't have any. Um, for this survey, only two contracts out of the 700 were priced on a per meg sustained model, which is pretty typical for CDN contracts. Most CDN contracts where it's just downloads and media for most customers are charged on a per gig delivered model. For those who don't know, there's two different ways CDNs charge. One is called per gig delivered, which means at the end of every month, quarter, or year, depending on what your commit is, you pay for every bit you push through the network. The other way to do pricing is what we call 95.5 or 95th percentile. That basically means that you commit to a certain amount up front every month or every quarter. So I might say, I'm going to commit to 10 megs every month and I'm going to pay X. As long as I don't burst above those 10 megs for more than 5%, each month, I'm paying just for those 10 megs, no matter how much bits I push through at any given time. Most customers do it on a per gig delivered model because there's typically no overages. When you go on a per gig delivered, if you commit to X and you do Y, you typically get a step down function to a lower price if it's enough volume. On a per meg sustained model of 95.5, you get hit with an overage. You agree to 10, but you do 12, you get dinged, and it's at more the price you were paying for 10. So most customers, it doesn't make sense on a 95.5 unless their traffic is pretty, pretty flat, it's pretty stable. Most video traffic, as you know, it's peaks and valleys because you don't know if someone's going to watch one minute of the video or five minutes. Are they going to watch it in standard definition? Are they going to watch it in high definition? So most contracts are done on 90, uh, per gig delivered model. The other thing with 95.5 is let's say I commit to 10 megs every month and last month I only used three. I'm paying for 10. So it's not a great thing for CDNs to do for certain customers because now the customer has a bad experience if I paid for something I didn't use. So that's why most contracts in the space today are still done on a per gig delivered model. This is really important. I did a blog post, I don't know, maybe two or three months ago and it was entitled, I know about the CDN market because of people smarter than me. So I've been tracking the CDM market for a long time. I talked to policymakers, telcos, carriers, backbone providers, vendors, customers, Wall Street money managers. I'm the first one to point out I don't know everything about the CDM market. There's a lot of people who nicely quote me or say, Dan Raber knows everything about the CDM market. I don't. <laughs> okay, there's people who know way more than I do. I'm not a network engineer. But as I say down here, I get to speak to the smartest people who are building out these CDNs public and private, the ones who are actually in the trenches building it out, buying transit all over the world, doing interconnect deals, co-location, all the hardware, you know, everything that goes into building these services, those are the people that I get to speak to, from the largest companies to the smallest in many different verticals. Um, so my goal is just to always share that. I always say to people, my goal with the CDN information I have is to inform, educate, and empower people. That's all I'm trying to do is provide that information. So I also wanted to thank all the customers and vendors who trust me with their information. The way I get a lot of this information is because I make myself available at any time, customers will call and say, here's a contract for my CDN. Can you please look it over? So they're trusting me with documents that they probably maybe aren't even allowed to send me under NDA, but um, they send them anyway. So I never use customer names <clears throat> unless I have permission 
Vendors give me a lot of information as well. Again, I, I, I like hearing from customers better, but some of the vendors are very good about telling me what their actual costs are or some sort of build out they're do doing or their capacity. A lot of them give me capacity numbers, which they usually don't make public. So if you ever want help with a CDN, contract, if you're trying to pick and choose the right CDN, my phone number is listed on my blog. It's on streammedia.com. Um, as I said earlier this morning, I answer all calls 24-7. I do sleep. People do ask me that. I do. I do take calls from all over the world, from all different kinds of customers. Um, but it's how I collect all the information, and it's a way to give back. So feel free to always contact me. I don't make any percentage off your contract. Um, if I say, hey, you should go talk to these two CDNs, I don't get a kickback. I don't get a referral fee. I don't have NDA signed with these guys. It's purely just sharing of information completely. And if you go to cdmpricing.com, I've been sharing this information and pricing probably dating back to 06, and I've been collecting it since 98. So um, this is just sort of what I do. Um, these slides are not going to be up at cdmpricing.com until I always say I'm going to get them up before the show. And of course, I never do because I just never have time. So I know a lot of you are going to want them right away. If you come up afterwards, just give me your card or send me an email, and I'll shoot them out to you tonight. But realistically, they won't be up at cdmpricing.com until tomorrow. And I also have to do a change over of a redirect. Right now, it links to the presentation from last year. If you want to find historical pricing, just on my blog, just type in CDM pricing, and you can see all the historical pricing going back to 06. I used to put out pricing every quarter because that's how much pricing was changing in the 06 to 09 time frame. But now I just do it once a year. So with that, let's go into questions. Also, some additional resources. CDNList.com is all the vendors in the market. CDMPricing.com I just spoke of. There's not so much going on around the patents in the CDN space anymore. There used to be. You had a lot of companies suing one another over patents. But if you want to read about all the patents and see the whole history, if you go to CDMPatents.com, CDMMarket.com will take you to the size of the CDM market. Uh, this will, all of these will take you to my blog, but this is the easy way to find them. CDNReport.com is a report I put out every year through Frost & Sullivan. So in addition to streaming media and my blog, I also work as a principal analyst at Frost & Sullivan. So most of the work we do is private. We're not really in the business of churning out a lot of reports and trying to get people to buy them. Most of the work we do is large companies come to us and ask us to do uh, everything from what's the market size of a potential new product they want to launch in the industry, uh, or we're thinking of deploying something inside a carrier network. What's the architecture look like? We go out and talk to a lot of carriers. Should they deploy in the core, the middle mile, last mile? How does it all work? That's mostly what we do at, at Frost or what I do. And a lot of it is outside the US as well. But I do put out a couple of reports through Frost every year. One is on transparent caching. If you go to transparentcaching.com, and then the other one, cdnreport.com. Contentdeliveryblog.com will take you to all the posts on my blog just about content delivery, because it's not the only thing I write about. So if you want to find all those, just go there. And you already know about the CDN Summit. So with that, I've got time for a bunch of questions. So I'll answer as many as I can. Michael? Yeah, so you're right. I thought CDM pricing would be down much more than it has been, uh, really, last year and this year. This year I was expecting initially, last year I was expecting it this year to be down much more than it is. I think part of that is just that the CDNs have done such a better job of walking away from business. They really have a good mindset now of we have to take on the right customer and the strategic customer at the right price point as opposed to taking on just any customer. So you think, uh, you know, think of what Akamai said a couple quarters ago when they said we had a bunch of contracts expiring in the media business at the end of the year that we're not going to renew because it's not strategic to our business. I believe that's the exact term they use, strategic. So that's not to say they couldn't make money on it. They're simply saying it's not strategic to everything that they're trying to do. So that was pretty interesting because we hadn't really heard them say that before. And they are the largest, so they certainly do represent a lot of the others uh, in the industry in terms of the trends. But I, I think it's just purely that the, uh, the CDNs have gotten a lot smarter. It's not 
as a result of lack of traffic growth? Because I never thought the traffic would spike like many of the CDNs predict. So the question is, uh, we've heard a lot today at the summit about hybrid CDNs, Amazon certainly in the market. We have a lot of new small entrants being focused. Could that destabilize pricing? Uh, also, you mentioned Comcast has their own commercial CDN. It always has the potential to. Um, I don't really think it does, simply because the new entrants coming to the market are extremely small. They've raised a lot of money, many of them. But a lot of them are projecting to do 5 or $6 million in revenue this year for the whole year. So they have a long way to go before they really disrupt the market. Uh, also, a lot of them are not selling video. They're selling mobile acceleration, content acceleration, dynamic site acceleration. Those services, as you know, are sold where there's a huge performance difference. There's a performance difference where customers are willing to pay for a, a premium. So the example I always give, if you've got two computers in your desk and you start up a video stream from CDNA and CDNB at the same time. If one of those streams starts up half a second faster, do you care? Probably not. More importantly, does it impact your business? Do you make money or lose money over a half a second with video? No. Now, think about commerce, think about mobile content acceleration, think about dynamic content generation, uh, content delivery. Half a second can be the difference between you making money or losing money or delivering ad or not delivering ad, or losing a sub. So the good news is the specialists that are coming into the market are focusing on the value add services that are outside of video. And many customers there are willing to pay a premium for fractions of a second of performance. No customer that I've ever seen is willing to pay a lot of money for fractions of a second in difference in performance of video startup. Now, if you're talking one second versus five seconds or one second versus three seconds, that'd be different. But today, Part of the reason why a lot of the major content owners use two CDNs for video delivery is they'll say the performance difference amongst them is almost identical. So is there always the threat? Yes. Is Amazon a threat? Absolutely. I thought Amazon would impact pricing a little bit more than they have. But Amazon's a tricky one because they think about the business differently. They are taking a very long-term view of this. They're not trying to win over the next year or two. They're building out a business that's extremely long-term. Amazon also has the ability to make money from other services. A lot of the other CDNs can't. So Amazon is always one to watch because of their size and scale. Uh, disruption, all depends on how you classify disruption. But do I think it disrupts pricing over the next year? No. Other questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Question is market growth for CDN services in Europe and Asia in terms of pricing or just growth? So I don't have enough data from Asia. I talked to some customers here and there. Um, depends on the region you're looking at. You know, for instance, in China, you can't beat China Cash just because nobody can come close to them in price. They're sort of the local incumbent. That's who you have. Um, Europe pricing is pretty stable. You don't see the traffic growth that you have in the U.S. that you do uh, in Europe that you see in the U.S. Um, but see me afterwards. I have some specific European and pricing from APAC that I can I can share with you offline. Other questions? Yes, sir. So what you're asking is, um, how are OVPs, online video platforms, think Kaltura, Brightco, Vuala, and others, um, how are they tying into CDNs? And is there some sort of competition taking place? Yes and no. So keep in mind that the OVPs don't own a CDN. So they're reselling another one. The interesting trend that we've seen, uh, and Brightco talked about this publicly, is a lot of their contracts used to include a large portion of it, bandwidth that they're just reselling. 
many of the OVPs are moving away from that and they're saying to the customer, you give us the platform fee, but why don't you get, go get your own CDN contract directly from the CDN provider? So there's not competition there, I would say. Um, however, there's some other additional services that they sell, like transcoding or media management or content protection, where the OVP, that's what they do. And the CDN also has a solution many times as well. So there is some overlap there. Some of the agreements, partnerships, whatever you want to call them that have been worked out between CDNs and OVPs, there is a bit sometimes of they're competing against the same customers or trying to pull a partner's customer away. There is a little bit of that. Um, Limelight, Limelight went out and bought Delve Networks many years ago because they wanted to own the OVP, OVP piece. So, you know, they're unique as a CDN because they own that layer. Akamai partners with Brightco. Level 3 has an end-to-end -end ecosystem. Most people don't know, but they bought a small company called Servcast many years ago based in Europe, so that gave them the platform. And then you have Verizon. They went out and bought Uplink to put with Edgecast so that they would have the platform plus the CDN. But then also you have you know, guys like Istream Planet and others who are working with all of them still doing a lot of the signal acquisition and transcoding. So there definitely is, you know, these companies mesh with one another. I wouldn't say it's a huge problem in the industry, but you talk to some of the sales reps or vendors at some of these companies, and yeah, they're, they're at times upset that sometimes they're going after the same customer. Follow-up? Go ahead. You potentially can get, you're saying a statement more than a question, you're potentially getting a better price going to an OVP for yeah. delivery than you go directly to a CDN. Yes and no. Part of the problem is that people don't go to the right CDNs. So I will have people say that exact same thing to me and say, well, I went to Akamai and they want to charge me X, but Breakcove wants to charge me Y. Well, you're a customer doing $2,500 a month reoccurring. You shouldn't be going to Akamai. That's not the customer they want. That's not the customer they're set up for. That's not the type of pricing they have. You go to one of their resellers. So a lot of times it's also customers are going to the wrong CDN. They don't understand the size of the customer that CDN is going after. But for a, what I call an SMB customer, small, medium business customer, you also have CDN specifically selling to them. Think Max CDN. Great CDN that's char targeting a customer doing $2,000 a month. You'll get very aggressive pricing much lower than Akamai, but not a fair comparison because, again, Akamai is not selling to that size customer. So for some customers, yes, the OVP does help. The OVP is buying a bucket of bandwidth from the CDN, and they pass that on to the customers, especially small ones. Yes, sir. Yes. So the question is, Akamai recently acquired uh, Octoshape, which is a P2P company based out of Europe. Uh, I couldn't tell you. They don't really comment on it. Um, Akamai doesn't give out a lot of information publicly or privately on their business media. We don't have any CDN customers they have, what percentage of their revenue is video related, what percentage of traffic over their network is video. Really don't know. Um, Octoshape's been around the market for a long time. They've been trying to sell for quite some time. Uh, they couldn't raise another round. Um, Akamai also had already bought another P2P company a couple of years ago called Red Swoosh for $10 million. So my guess is that they're going to use that technology just like they did for Red, with Red Swoosh to try and do more uh, seeding of downloads, more download content than streaming. I thought it was interesting that in the press release and sort of the way the companies talked about it, they talked about it as like a... Um, you know, a multicast, I think was the term they used, you know, company that they bought. Octoshape's not multicast. Multicast isn't even enabled out there most of the world. It's P2P. But P2P has such a stigma to it, that term. I think people don't really want to use it still. Um, but specifically what they're going to do, what products does it roll into down the line, I have no idea. I got time for one or two more questions. No? Okay. People want to go have drinks. Great. So uh, just real quick. You have to go downstairs to the first floor. If you take the, if you go down here and you go to the escalators and just go around the escalators, you'll see a sign that says uh, the reception. It's all the way at the end. It's called Urban Kitchen. Um, I'm going to stay here to answer any more questions if you have them. 
and then I'll be down there. Thank you for attending. Any follow-up questions, please let me know. Thank you.